Okay, I wanted to close this week with a more clarification, more clarification on the matter of qualifications and skill or the lack of them as a source of long running weaknesses in entrepreneurship in Uganda and generally in Africa. This is because skill is everything. And we often develop skill by doing more of what we like to do or what we are made to do, what we feel strong about. Skill is what eventually builds the necessary financial and other forms of capital for a business. You know, you don't know what you do not know. And someone who knows what you don't know will charge ahead of you, at least in the short term, until you discover what they know. There is a reason why even with Africans taking charge of their national leadership for more than 60 years now, uh, you know, since independence in the 60s, there is a reason why we still have deep misgivings about taking charge of the economic realm and often we rely on leadership in this area from foreigners. Now, by, 19, by September 1969, when I was born, Makere University was the most prestigious university college that every youth aspired to join. There were very few who made it, for to get access to education at the time was a very rare chance. Makerere College, as it was called then, was affiliated to London University, and it had fewer than 3,000 students out of a population of 9 million people, where some 96% of this 9 million, 96% were in the subsistence sector, or they were simply growing food for eating, and nothing extra for the market, which is a typical pre-industrial peasant society. The attraction to the university then was not to create new ground for the country's enterprise and innovation sectors, but rather to fill jobs of departing colonial officers and administrators. I remember some time ago when I was reading Nyerere's writings, Nyerere, former president of Tanzania, used to say that when a graduate in the developed world makes a television set on an assembly line for home entertainment, his or her counterpart, a graduate of civil engineering in Tanzania, should feel much happier if they are building a road, constructing a new bridge to connect a village to another, drilling a borehole, or building a hospital where to treat diseases. This is because, Nyerere would say, Africa ne Africa's needs were still the construction of nations and their institutions ground up, while the West's basic needs were already met. Only in the West, perhaps, a search for how their populations would live easier, live easier lives and, less and with less and less dependence, so that they can enjoy the very entertainment objects uh, being made in a factory line, by small nuclear families undisturbed. It seems to me that in many African countries, for those who had access to some level of education in the 60s and 70s, they must have gone through a lot of trouble to pay school fees, to cover long distances on foot, with parents often risking all they had to keep their children in school. However, the unintended result of this struggle seems to have been an inspiration by the graduates to get a government job that gave their family comfort, security, and a life less of hassle, uh, otherwise difficult to attain if one chose enterprise. Eh? Professor Ali Mazlui, a lecturer at Makerere College then, writing in 1975, summarizes this position very well. In his book, a book is called Soldiers and Kinsmen in Uganda, he asks in a very pointed way, and I quote, does an excessive struggle in youth in pursuit of a particular goal, say education, create an excessive attachment to economic security at the end of, an ent of the enterprise? Are well-educated Africans inclined towards more leisurely jobs, partly because the acquisition of an education requires victory over so many uh, handicaps, close quote. Now he continues, like open quote, there is certainly evidence that sophisticated Africans are disproportionately security conscious 
in their adult economic life and they are unwilling to take risks which might lead to the loss of their jobs. By the same token, they are reluctant to engage in economic activities or enterprises which combine potential high returns with actual high risk. The question which arises is whether this kind of psychological mentality has been consolidated by the peculiar difficulties of acquiring an education in Africa and by the high premium given to education as a passport to a world of secure privileges, close quote. Look, I disagree with Mazrui's assessment, but I cannot find any better explanation for the overarching attractiveness of government sector to many young people then and now. The outcome of this temptation to work for government was eventually that enterprise, business acumen, and creativity were not very well promoted at school and at a family level. Now, to go into business or to go to technical college then and even sometimes today was and is still frowned upon by many parents and it is equated with failure. Yet to go to a technical college in Germany, for example, one mentioning one country in Europe, and to take practical hands-on apprenticeship in that country, it, that is the true passport to a future life of productive enterprise for young people. In Uganda in the 1960s, the graduates were few and the government sector could absorb all. I think even Milton Obote at the time, president of the country, wanted more indigenous Ugandans in the economy and enterprise building, yet the only ones, the only people who could understand management of a business were rushing into government instead. His move to the left in 1970, which was a fashion in Africa for many leaders at the time to forcefully nationalize private enterprise in the hope that local people would participate in the economy, this was not necessarily attractive to Makerere graduates. The graduates instead would step outside of the university gates to find jobs, houses, and cars waiting for them, both from the enterprising Indian community and from the civil service. However, few chose to work in the private sector because, as I indicated earlier, many were very disincentivized to risk-taking, disincentivized to creativity, disincentivized to enterprise. Because of this, manufacturing and the critical innovation and trade craft necessary for Uganda to grow was left to a small Asian community that had been extracted from their homeland by the British to build the Uganda railway line a century earlier. And those who came, plus those who came in search of work following the, their relatives. Eh? Those of you listening to me and watching might know that extraction of communities from their surroundings means that wherever they go, their levels of risk taking, their unanimity and cooperation on matters of credit, for example, their management of their businesses, their political subtleness, all these tend to be on a higher level given the limited options those communities uh, you know, have whenever they go to another country. If you doubt this, you go and read the history and see how ostracized Jewish communities that were dispersed across Europe somehow ended up creating big financial houses which funded the wars in Europe and the empires of 18th and 19th century in that continent. Perhaps if you want a closer home example, you should visit Myenga and Kansanga suburbs of Kampala today. You will see how the Eritrean and Ethiopian diaspora is reshaping the real estate there in a very committed and united, neat way. It is the same with the Asians early 20th century. The Asian success in the Ugandan economy was rapid and it was visible in the first half of the 20th century in our country. I remember in 2008, I visited with the last surviving son of Nanji Kalidas Meta. He was about 75. And he gave me his father's biography. That biography is titled A Dream Half Expressed was published in 1966. In that biography, 
his father mentions how he would stand on the seashore. Now this is the sea, the Indian Ocean on the other side of India. He would stand and just watch the waves for hours, watch the ships move in and out, and that he would feel that the waves were inviting him to go to the other side. That's how he ended up in Mombasa. When he finally set sail and came to Mombasa, eventually settling in Lugazi, here in Wikwe, there was no turning back. Kalidas Meta became a sugar baron. Now, instead of our leaders studying from the Indian success to try and get it right for a young Uganda, some of our leaders, I think, developed envy. Well, you could say the British, for more than 60 years, protected these Asian businesses. The key areas they were in were restricted. Local people were not allowed, for example, to participate in the ginning of cotton, in the processing of sugar, of coffee, tobacco, tea, and many others. But we need to know that learning as a response is better than jealousy. In learning, you take some lessons to those communities that you want to help change for better. It seems on account largely of the Asians limited intermarriage with our local Ugandan communities, some people like Idi Amin were offended. I mean the sensibilities and I should say inferiority complexes got him to pull the trigger, ending in the mass expulsion of some 50,000 Asians in August 1972 destroying the little skill and competencies in business that we had as a country. Amin thought that by distributing expropriated Asian properties to his people, that he was in a quote, Ugandanizing and skilling our economy and encouraging a local entrepreneurial spirit. Instead, the economy so badly shrunk that by 1978, towards the end of 1978, I remember this because I was a nine-year-old boy, the growth was a whooping negative 14% from what it was eight years prior. So it's not just slow growth, it's a negative. We had gone down so badly. Today, it is 51 years later, but as they say, old habits die hard. Uganda has almost 44 million people. It has an economy of 37 billion US dollars. It has more than 50 universities, not one. And the old Makerere has some 40,000 students today. 10% of these pursuing postgraduate courses, around 139 of them. But listen to this. 51 years later, the number of registered enterprises is still less than a million. They range between 800 and a million. The numbers are just a little three times higher than the numbers of people in the public service. What does this mean? Enterprises, even with the passage of time, are still few and far in between for the level of economic activity and stability we have had at least in the last 30 years. The same goes for the number of taxpayers. There are only 1.8 million in an adult working population of more than 25 million. This also goes with skill and qualification for the industry. This is the reason some leading managers of our enterprises in Uganda are shipped from the region and beyond so that our businesses can keep working. All this is happening while young people, the abundance of who, which we have, we have an abundance of young people, 78% of our, uh, our population, some people say. The abundance of which we have and are known for the blessing in its own right, these young people are instead fighting to get into politics, into government and administration work in order to make a living. Now, I don't want anybody to get me wrong. Government and public administration are good. Nothing is wrong with getting a vacancy there. After all, don't we need good people to work for government? However, listen to me, the disproportionate attention to government means that fewer people are creating the necessary enterprises that a country gets taxes from. 
while at the same time we are increasing consumption and we are not learning enterprise skills needed to push our country to the next level. We would like to hear from you. Please email us at info at tapmedia.com and visit our website at www.tapmedia.com. You can also visit our offices located at Tomosi Business Park, Luzira, Port Bell Road, or call 0414-220-702. Thank you.